when we are doing the will of our true self, we are inevitably doing the will of the universe. In magic, these are seen as indistinguishable, that every human soul is in fact one human soul. It is the soul of the universe itself, and as long as you are doing the will of the universe, then it is impossible to do anything wrong. Shalom and welcome to Prague Magic. I am your host, Keats Ross. And after a deluge of media setbacks, damn retrograde, I guess, it is my esteemed pleasure to finally premiere my wonderful chat with the incredible Caitlin Foise and Dr. Vanessa Sinclair. We transdimensionally wayfare through the glitches and tussles of the metaphysical cut up. Brian Geisen and William S. Burroughs' pioneering form of artistic witchcraft that has inspired many an art witch ever since. So much so that the cut-up seems to be the final frontier of art, a destination amidst the Ein Sof where all creativity pummels into itself. This chat was inspiring to say the least as we weave through Caitlin and Vanessa's brilliant interpretations of the craft, as Caitlin coins it, glitchcraft, and discuss the powerful mental health and healing properties of reckless creation. It's wonderful to discuss things like nostalgiamancy and cut-ups as a form of time travel. Or, as Burroughs said, it is a matter of the future and the past being laid out so that you can see both the future and the past from the present. Caitlin Foise is a wonderful media mage, illustrator, writer, tarot diviner. She has worked with the Smashing Pumpkins recently, creating the artwork for William Patrick Corgan's tours by correlating the fool's journey of the tarot arcana within his own nostalgiamancy and decades-long songwriting. Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, a friend of the show, host of the Rendering Unconscious podcast, a psychologist, a published author, an artist, and so, so much more. Together, her and Caitlin create a symphony of cut-up cultures via their Chaos of the Third Mind project. You can find links to all of their wonderful projects uh, in the description below. And without further ado, let's just get to it. So they're here, they're weirdos and witches. Here's my chat with Caitlin Foise and Dr. Vanessa Sinclair. I've been a big fan of both of your guys' work. I've had wonderful conversations with Vanessa in the past, so it's good to get you guys both in the same room to talk about uh, the generation of chaos of the third mind and all of your wonderful works. Um, I've heard that the genealogy of your guys' meeting had something to do with Houdini's grave. Can you talk a little bit about that? (laughs) Vanessa and I were visiting Houdini's grave and we made this joke that it would be really funny if we got locked in. (laughs) And then we did. (laughs) It started as a joke. It started as a joke. (laughs) But in the midst of getting locked in, we had this whole conversation about the things that we were interested in and cut-ups and uh, time travel and all these things. And then in the midst of being locked in this cemetery with Houdini, it sort of came about that we needed to work together and to create books and projects and spread the word of cut-ups and talk about Geisen and Burroughs and then of course right after that we found like this like weird tiny gate that was like slightly ajar that we could sort of slip through and we're like (laughs) Houdini thank you I love it like it sequestered you guys in there just to make the plans to work together it really did (laughs) that's really cool exactly yeah I talked to Vanessa in the past a bit about necromancy And a lot of what I'm hearing from you guys, you guys invoke a lot of, you know, there was gangsters like Al Capone and uh, Lucky Luciano and, you know, your writings about David Bowie and all of this stuff. And I was I was really wondering, like, what is 
you know, the process of kind of the invocation of these people, these artists, Burroughs and Geisen, like, how are you bringing that into the material world? Um, Vanessa, do you want to go or do you want me to? Go ahead and I'll add. Okay. <laughs> so for me, a lot of it is through film work, through cut-ups, through art. Um, I painted a piece of that was Burroughs, essentially. Um, it's around here. <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, and during that time, I went into this weird sort of trance where my roommate at the time was like, I don't know what happened to you. She was like, you would disappear for hours and then come back and drink like copious amounts of sugared tea and, you know, <laughs> paint this thing. And there was layers upon layers of it. And I realized the painting itself was sort of a cut up in, in progress. So with that, it was sort of tapping into Burroughs's process. And Later, looking back at the time frame of that piece, it coincided with a lot of events that Burroughs was going through, and I didn't even know it at the time. So I realized like there's something that's going on with art. There's something that, that's going on with cut-ups that allows you to sort of tap into different time frames all at once. And even with films too, it's just sort of, you know, kind of like going to these places that are you know, say places that were significant to these gangsters or to Burroughs or to Geisen, and then splicing them together and creating this narrative that also becomes part of this time frame. So for me, a lot of that sort of like necromancy is through art, through cut-ups, through um, taking something that already exists or a building that already exists or something and splicing it into this time frame with the past and creating this narrative that's now and future. I love it, exactly. Vanessa. Um, yeah, I mean, Caitlin and I, all we talk about is how much we miss our adventures. When we both lived in New York, we used to just go on all these really necromantic adventures like to Houdini's grave, or we'd go around the Lower East Side to like all of Lucky Luciano's old haunts, or we just, we just love doing that kind of thing. And it's like, um, in one way, it's like a little bit of role playing and you can really get into like different characters and tap into different times by like, say, going to an old speakeasy and like having a date with Lucky and Al, <laughs> which we love to do. <laughs> um, but you yeah. can also like Burroughs always said, you know, just doing the cutouts with language in itself is like cutting up somebody's words. And even though those, that person might be gone, their words are still alive and they're still alive through those words. So you can cut up somebody's writing and have them say new things to you um, in real time. Yeah, I love that aspect. You know, it got me reeling too, thinking about almost a sort of like nostalgia mancy with your own past work. Have you guys experimented with, you know, you guys are both very prolific. Have you guys experimented with taking things from different eras of your own life and switching it around, making something A little new? bit. I started to go into older writing and, you know, sort of printing that out and cutting it up and doing cut-ups with that. So I was like, okay, this is interesting. These are old poems. Um, and I've created some work with these older writings that I sort of put together and then create new stories or poetry with. Um, and sometimes I take things that are older photographs or things like that and then splice in newer stuff. A lot, a lot of time that happens with my films. Yeah. Vanessa, yeah. have you experimented with that yeah I mean even today when I've been making a lot of collages that are kind of icons of people that have passed and then I'll photograph the collages and then I'll print them out Carl got me this little printer called a selfie where you can print out photos from your phone um yeah. and so I've been printing out like collages and then putting the collage the printed out collages into new collages so that they end up being like little parts of new works I love it I love that yeah, because that's, you know, it reminds me a lot too within, you know, my music creation and, you know, I've gotten into, you know, taking samples of old music I've created in the past and regenerating them into something new and that does like sing a different song completely. Do you guys uh, have a praxis with the cut ups? Is there like a meditation to them? Is there, you know, and any kind of like magical working as you're doing them? 
Um, I think that they become magical workings. For me, what happens is when I get an idea for something, the idea takes over my brain. And sometimes it'll be triggered by a song. Sometimes it will be triggered by something. And I will just listen to that over and over and over again until I see the entire thing forming. And sometimes when I start working on it, it forms into something else because sometimes it wants to be something else. Um, so that becomes the meditation in itself for me. Uh, I don't really have a process for like getting into the space of things. Like usually when something hits me, it just hits me so hard that I can't do anything until it's done. Yeah, I feel Vanessa? Like we, I feel like we live in this world. <laughs> right. So like I yeah. don't think I have to go into like a certain state to like do <laughs> magic or cut-ups or art. It's just kind of like life all the time. Um, so yeah, but we do, like we mentioned in the London talk, we made this, um, oil where yeah. Caitlin worked on an oil for Burroughs and I worked on an oil for Geisen and then we combined them and made this like third mine oil. So I don't remember what I was working on recently, but I did pull out the oil for something I was doing recently and put that on. Um, I have like where, where I sit and make all of my collages is like, I showed Caitlin the other day when we were talking, um, it's just like an entire altar to like all these dead people like you right. know Burroughs and Geisen and Paul Bowles and uh, Lady J and Genesis and just everybody there's like I have like a whole section of my house now <laughs> my kind of third mine we yeah, call it the altar. 23rd mine now too because there's so many of us in there right in the I and love that I painted the the portrait of Lady J for for you Vanessa when I signed it I signed a year ahead, mm -hmm. oh. which was something I never, but we realized it coincided with something Vanessa was doing that was supposed to come out. And I was like, okay, so. <laughs> that totally segues into a uh, big thing I wanted to ask you guys about is your experiments with uh, Burroughs' intersections mm -hmm. and, you know, time travel as, yeah. you know, you can totally relegate it to be. Uh, explain what like your processes with, you know, this time travel aspect of cut-ups and whatnot? So for me, the time travel has a lot to do with history, bringing history into this space and time, and also being able to sort of work magic with it and create the future that you kind of want to create as well. I have a lot of intersections that happen all the time. I'm constantly reading things and I'll go outside and something will happen. And I'll be like, okay, here we go. And also, I mean, the work that I do in my everyday job besides tarot is normally I'm working on, you know, something for William Patrick Corgan, either Smashing Pumpkins or his, you know, like solo tours or Madame Zuzu's or something. And I mean, he's completely into these intersections as well. So we'll be talking and there'll be intersections happening. And it's creating this larger narrative of time travel because it's sort of like branching out on its own. It's like this tree that keeps like, you know, flowering and, and keeping leaves. So you're essentially creating like a root base with your art, but it's ever expanding into other artists, into other times into the future while remaining grounded in past historical, you know, whatever magical occult. Um, so it's this whole thing that just sort of keeps growing. Um, you know, when I wanted to move to Chicago, I did this whole film where I took uh, pieces of films that I had taken in Chicago. I then recorded different documentaries of like gang stuff and you know other things and different parts of Chicago from you know like 1920s 1930s and I spliced them in together and then I took screenshots and those screenshots became a magical working in itself as well as these you know films um and so it was capturing multiple time frames but it was also creating a gateway for me to push forward in my plans to move to Chicago. So with time travel, it's essentially a gateway. Yeah, it's essentially a, a number of crossroads where you stand at the middle and you're like, okay, which way do I wanna go? How yeah. can I open these doors? 
I often talk about, you know, magic being uh, more, you're more conducting the pathways rather than the objectives. Right. right. So that's, yeah, that sounds like, sounds like a supreme form to do so, you know, and it's funny too, you started working with B William Patrick Corgan or Billy Corgan as he was widely known, you know, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the, my little 13 year old goth heart. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, which is fascinating because you, I think you started doing the illustrations for the tour in which he was playing a lot of like classics. Like it was kind of a, yes. a time travel, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And we tied in so much of the occult and, you know, so many, I mean, we have so many similar interests, like he and I can talk for hours about our interests, but um it was tying in so much of what I was actually doing at the time, which, you know, we're talking about 13 year old parts, you know, like right. when, when the pumpkins really started to get huge. Um, and I'm like, oh my God, I'm tying in all this stuff that I was, you know, reading about and sort of, you know, working on then and into this process at that time where I was like barely sleeping and working like 15 hours a day <laughs> trying to get all these things done. Um, and so that was almost like this crazy meditation in time travel. Yeah, yeah they, I, had, they did a series of tarot cards for that too. And I mm -hmm. hope eventually that becomes a tarot deck because they're amazing. Yeah, Absolutely. I noticed those in the, uh, in the pictures I've seen or the videos I've seen, gorgeous, like, it, it really tied it together. And, you know, I've always suspected somewhat of a, I mean, obviously a spiritual, you know, uh, um, undertone with a lot of his work and whatnot. So it was cool to kind of see it viscerally, you know, somewhat of a, an occultic, you know, perspective to it. So I thought it, yeah, I thought it was beautifully rendered. I mean, it was, it really was cool. essentially the fool's journey. Right. Yeah. So the and whole... To the whole tour the whole show was the fool's journey that's true yeah did you guys equate maybe songs to certain tarot cards and yes like, yeah. I, for the um for today i did a series of tarot cards for the song today and he gave me a basic thing he was like so if you were doing a reading he was like what cards would you equate with such and such journey and so I'm going to keep that to myself because I don't know if he wants that out in the public, but, um, you know, so I chose the tarot cards and I said, what do you think of this spread? And he said, perfect. So that was how we kind of uh, created that. And then I would just send him, you know, in progress shots, but it's, it, it definitely was this whole thing of this is the fool's journey. This is the process of which we go through like in our own psyches. So if you watch the entire show, you're essentially like going along the fool's journey. You'll meet the, the high priestess. You'll, you know, do all of these things. And what it's doing is it's, it's essentially like opening you up. And, you know, all of Billy's songs are basically like downloads anyway. So as you're listening to it, as you're experiencing it, you are receiving information it's just, it's opening you up. It's allowing you to time travel. It's allowing you to create this cut up moment in your own time and to see, you know, this progress or this process. And uh, Vanessa, you know, I don't think I was able to tell you like in person, but you know, my condolences for Genesis and whatnot. I was able to talk to Carl a little bit, you know, about their passing and you've mentioned that you're working with cutups, you know, with Genesis and Lady J, is that sort of a same scenario? Are you finding like in an outward journey, you know, past the finality of life, like through this creation with them and, you know, people that you've known and worked with? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. that's for everybody who's sad. I'm like, Jen's, Jen's still around. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and now they're together. So they're very happy. So like, even though we miss Jen, like, Jen's great. Jen's happy. They're happy. Yeah. They're together. Um, so that's good. Um, and 
I would say a lot of things that I learned. Um, one thing I learned in particular from working with Jen and knowing Jen is is how songs are like these little sigils, like Caitlin's talking about, or like magical workings that I never really understood before until it, maybe until you have like a personal relationship with someone who creates that way, then you can kind of see like when something's going on with them or in your life, and you can see a certain song will like pop up at that moment. It's really synchronous and strange um, and has a really interesting impact. So I never really thought about how magical songs were until I knew them. Um, and as far as, you know, working past the past death, past the grave, um, you know, in the third mind, that's what the dedication says is like to and for all third minds at all times everywhere. So they, Burroughs and Geisen put it out there then that, you know, the, they're going to be working with people that they that they've never met or like like Caitlin and I had noticed that book came out in 1978 so right around when we were being born so like we're, be, we're being born they're saying this and then we end up working with their third mind you know decades later it's mm -hmm. really amazing there was that quote from Geisen right that uh writing is 50 years behind art or something rather and you know that really sang to me because I think the cut-ups have always been this very innovative you know, passionate response to taking all that came before and creating new voices, you know, within that. Um, and you guys seem to have like this uh, generation of through different mediums of cut ups. And I wanted to know what's uh, is it like the culmination of film, sound, you know, art? Is that really kind of the the plexus, you know, of of all of the cut ups situations and mediums that really sing to you? Or is there a certain type is it the collage work is it the you know i like which, all of them yeah i think they're all great in their own way yeah yeah i think so too i go through phases i you know i find like sometimes i just can't stop making films yeah. um and sometimes i can't stop doing cut-ups and sometimes i just want to you know watercolor and, and write over and over and over again and it just sort of depends on what's happening um but all of them are a really incredible sort of medium. You know, sometimes it's photos. Uh, you know, Burroughs used to work magic with photos. Mm -hmm. it, you know, when he was living in New York, there was a cafe that popped up that was, I think it was in New York. Um, and he didn't like it because he thought that it was just bringing yuppies to the area. So he took pictures of it and basically like scratched it out, like erased it from the scene <laughs> and was so pleased with himself when like a few months later, like it closed down. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I love that. You know, what really inspired me in my youth too was the, the tape, you know, cut ups yes. and stuff that he was doing. And there's something that sings to me about like the, uh, the analog part mm -hmm. of, you know, cassette tapes and yes. working with samples and that stuff. Is there, you know, I guess my question is like, is there a certain tactical medium that feels kind of more, you know, visceral, like channeling through? Is it, you know, like a materialistic touchstone that helps? Or is it, it you know, I'm, you've just said that it's, you guys live it. So it just kind of pours through you. So right. maybe well, answer I mean my own question. <laughs> it, it does depend. I mean, when you brought up tapes, I mean, I, I love that you brought that up because as a teenager, I didn't go anywhere ex without a mini recorder. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had it in my pocket at all times. I had it in yeah, the car, taping conversations, TV, all of that stuff. I think I still have those little mini tapes. Um, and I had actually been thinking about getting another recorder that, like that or finding my old one. But for me, I mean, part of it is that process. I mean, when Vanessa and I were traveling around doing our talks on cutups, all I wanted to use was film cameras. Yeah. And I mean, I think I brought like a bag filled with them in like two outfits. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I had like all these cameras <laughs> and I was just taking out cameras. Um, but it was so important for me to have like this film and feel myself like, you know, putting the film in and taking these analog photos. And, you know, and a lot of the stuff that we have now is digital, which is its own magic in itself. Um, you know, so it really just depends on what I'm sort of feeling or what's at hand. Like if I'm out there and I need to film fast, obviously it's going to be my phone. Right. Um, but 
there's so many things that you can do to splice up your phone to make it, you know, into the, the tool that you need. Um, but sometimes like, I just really want to put my hands like on scissors and cut things up. So for me, it's just whatever is kind of speaking through at the time or whatever I have on hand. Yeah. Yeah, what I've been doing lately, I have like a whole process that kind of uses everything. So I've been making collages um, with scissors and glue. Um, I don't know how to use Photoshop. So all of my collages are scissors and glue. I've seen them um, on Instagram. Yeah, they're wonderful. Yeah, I'm, I've been doing them every day for since November 2nd. Um, yes. <laughs> definitely every day. Um, but I've been making collages and then I put the cut ups. I have like well, now I have a whole trunk full, full of cutouts, but I take some from the trunk into a shoebox and, and I pull cutouts from that and I put those into the collages. And then I've been reading myself recording the cutouts that are in the collages and then setting those to music to make albums and then making little videos to go along with the songs. I love it. Yeah, it's I look just the cross platform of mediumship, you know, with it and encompassing it all. Um, you guys are both very prolific, too. And I guess, you know, Caitlin, you kind of answered this. It sounds like you just find, follow the song. Like if you're inspired, you do something. You know, I've asked Vanessa and Carl many times because, you know, they're very prolific, too. Like the routine of a day. Like, do you, you know, are you mapping things out? Are you sitting yourself in a place to, you know, channel the song? Or is it just as it's, it comes? Well, it's it's been very different since quarantine. Right. Um, so, and also since I moved to Chicago, be, uh, you know, so in New York, it would be like, I got up and then sometimes I would be like, I need to go to this place. Like, I just, you know, whether it was a historic place or Dead Horse Bay or something, you know, but I would be like, just something in me, it would just be like, you need to get on the train right now. You need to go. Like, people would be like, why don't you ever invite me? I was like, can you leave in five minutes? <laughs> because my I friend- could, that's why I would go. <laughs> I would just message Vanessa. I'd be like, we need to go here right now. And she'd be like, great. <laughs> um, I love it. That's that third mind singing, right? It really is. And, yeah. you know, since I, you know, moved to Chicago, it's a little bit harder to get around. So, and things are more sprawled out. But, uh, you know, I would be like, okay, I need to, you know, go to this hotel, say that, you know, Al Capone's people went to that still exists or, I would be like, I'm going to go to the green mill, which, you know, Al Capone's, you know, people ran that. So I'd be like, I'm going to go to the green mill and that's where I'm going to do my work today. And I would just, you know, take photos there. I would just sort of sit there, do whatever I had to do, drink coffee, um, you know, and get my work done and just kind of do that. And that's how things would sort of progress. Um, since quarantine, now it's like, I get up in the morning, I drink coffee and, I'm like, okay, like, what do I need to kind of do today? Whether, you know, it's like mundane work um, or, you know, working on a cut up or something like that. Can I, you know, fit it in? But usually it's just sort of, I mean, my days, I always want to be scheduled. I'm just not a scheduled person. <laughs> It's it's been, uh, it's definitely been my terror since quarantine is trying to do that. It's, it's like I've asked Vanessa very, you know, earnestly, like, how do you do it? You know, like, where, how do you do all the things in the day? You know, so it's, it's a continuing process. Yeah. I mean, usually I have a couple things that sort of get into my mind. It's like, you've got to complete these today. Right. So if I can get those things done, but I've been way less harder on myself as time goes on. Yeah. I've learned that as well. You know, and a big thing. What's that? Do easy. Yeah. Do easy. Always saying do easy. So mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, I gotta do easy, not make. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, I wanted to ask, you know, uh, Vanessa specifically, uh, thinking about the macro of cut ups, and maybe, you know, how can it relate to mental health? Is it like a form of like exorcism in a way? You know, I guess like all art is essentially, but there's something that sings about you know, using stuff that inspires you, creating something different. Maybe it puts you in a better space, you know, entirely. What have you found with that? Well, I think exactly because like like the do, the do easy, it's um, 
because you're just cutting things up, you don't have to worry so much about technique or how things turn out or like trying to do things in a specific way. So like if somebody's feeling frustrated, like they have writer's block or they're just like not feeling stuck in any way, you can, anybody can pick up a magazine or a newspaper. It doesn't even have to be your own writing if you don't write. Anybody can pick it up and cut it into pieces and mix it around and make something. So it's something that anyone can do. And it's kind of very liberating in that way where you don't have to worry about like knowing how to do it or doing it right or what your skill set is. And they always say something interesting. I mean, you can pick up the most banal thing that you're like, there's no way that this thing is going to say something. Like I've cut up ads for things. I'm like, I'm just going to cut the ads out of these like magazines and cut them up and it still will say something that's like really catchy or like really interesting so it's it's a real great way to like kind of break out of any sort of like neurosis that has you feeling like locked in and I think like a lot of people feel like very stuck or like they're going in a loop or they're stuck in a rut or they can't like get motivated so it's a way to kind of get yourself out of that rut without having to do much effort. Yeah, I love that. Um, I was thinking too, you know, since quarantine, I've tried to do this, been working with this idea of divergent magic and a sense of creating a ritual of the day to kind of help consort with the other that is brain chemistry, <laughs> you know, this like that sometimes oppressive nature of brain chemistry. And I was thinking, uh, you know, before talking with you guys about this idea of maybe, you know, cutting up the different projects of a day, rearranging them to kind of add spice, to kind of mm -hmm. add, you know, something a bit more in the somatic realm of, of a cut up. Have you guys yeah. experimented with that at all? Yeah, I mean, I I do that within life stuff and Burroughs right. often said to do it anyway. He was like, you know, like a cut up can be you taking a different route that you normally do. Right. And it just sort of shifts everything. Um, you know, and sometimes like I'll get up in the morning and if I know I have to do certain things, I'll be like, okay, like, how can I like shift these around? You know, how can I, I, I do that? Um, but, and also even taking, you know, sort of like color walks, like Burroughs was like a big fan right. of color walks where like you go for a walk and like you pick one color and then I photograph it because I'm like, okay, like, let me see what I can create that I wouldn't normally see by yeah. doing this, which is, you know, essentially cutting up your life and your schedule, but also cutting up the way that you see things around you. Yeah. It's that, and I have a fear too sometimes with, you know, the cut up technique of over intellectualizing it, you know, of thinking maybe too much about the intention of it, of reading too much into what it's saying afterwards. Um, have you guys, you know, is, is that a common frustration with them? Should you just let it lie? Should it, should it just be what it is? Just do it. Yeah, just do it. Yeah, <laughs> just do it. Don't think about it too much. You know, because uh, your guys' video that you did, um, the uh, you guys have done many, but there's one in particular, and uh, Caitlin was talking about using, you know, how she was choosing different sections of songs and mm -hmm. throwing them in the thing. I can still, uh, maybe this is just, you know, the human brain, but I can find pattern. I can hear like the sinew of, you know, cut ups in that medium and stuff right. and it's kind of like it's it's inspirational if not a little maddening because you're like why am i focusing so much on writing in, in a narrative structure or focusing right. so much in songwriting in a narrative structure why not you know displace it all <laughs> absolutely i mean i think you should display because I, I was that's what i was getting stuck on in the video is that you know like sometimes when i do videos and i'm working with music or bits of music i'm like oh but does this like you know, interlock with this one correctly. And with doing it rand at random, it was almost like I got the perfect combination. Right. And if there was a slip of the hands, like it's meant to be, you know, like, yeah, just if I go. cut into something too much, that's the way it's supposed to be. Like, and it yeah. took away a lot of the stress of doing it. Well, and I think especially when it's someone like, like you all who are so trained, like, 
trained as artists trained as musicians like you that that is so ingrained in you anyway that you don't really have to think about it like you're going to be putting it together that way unconsciously whether you consciously realize it or not Mm -hmm. so it will actually help you get out of your way because that's a lot of the problem with neurosis it's just people overthinking and I think one thing like since you asked about mental health um, I feel like what psychoanalysis used to be was people kind of understanding how, you know, things in our past or our parents um, make sense of what, how looking at that makes sense of what we are like now. But nowadays, I feel like people are so inundated with narrative and so focused already on that. I'm like, oh, this happened to me. So now I'm like this. They have so many ingrained narratives about their identity and who they are and who their family is and how it fits in the world and society. But I feel like now my job is to actually help people like get out of that so that they can kind of have more freedom because they're so like locked into these kind of roles. So that's a great way to just like help yourself kind of get out of all of that, like overthinking and categories and like structures that you're so inundated with already. I love it. Yeah. One of my, you know, continuous experiments with writing or music, you know, I guess essentially could be considered cut ups, but it's always, yeah, just to kind of uh, not do the usual in a way, you know, of what I'm pre, you know, programmed to kind of see or, or spill out. And so the cut up thing, you know, it's, it's long tried and true. Um, you guys are definitely a wonderful example of how you can create something. And as a listener, or as a viewer, as a reader, I can see something quite wonderful in it. It being very maybe disparate from your guys' readings of it or not. And it seems a bit like more straight to the source, right. if that makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, in Vanessa's book, she had mentioned Jonas Mikas, who is like, <laughs> yeah. you guys just get noises for that. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> but I used to be an art model. And the person that introduced me was the artist that I was posing for. And he was like, do you mind watching this? He was like, as a as a teenager and in my 20s, he's like, I would have hated this. And he was like, because I was so rigid in my thinking. And he was like, but I need to show you this. And so he showed it to me and I was like, wow, like this is really changing everything that I do. And this was before I started working on films, really. This was around 2008, 2009, I think that he may have showed this to me. Um, but as I saw that and I started watching more, um, Jonas was, was saying and, uh, that he used to do them in chronological order and he was very rigid about it and just sort of like trying to get everything, especially as he was cataloging. And then at some point he just let go and it became this beautiful series in itself. And, you know, so that was like this incredible moment for me because I'm very much a person that's like, it needs to be in this order and I have right. to do things in this matter. And so for me to break that out of my perfectionism, essentially, like, and break me out mm-hmm. of my brain pattern, uh, I started doing that. And that's when like the films really started to come together. And yeah, someone the other day was being like, I need to, they, they were filling out job applications and doing, you know, the intros and stuff. and. She was just like, I can't do this right now. And I was like, cut it up. And she was like, what? And I was like, cut it up. There's something you're missing. Just cut it up and see what you're missing and then rewrite it. And that at least makes it a little bit fun so that you're not in this rigid state where you're like, I'm doing oh, I love thing. That. Yeah, Don't unlock do. something. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah when That's you a, cut up your own advice. writing like that, you can see you, it will come back together in ways that you would have never made those connections consciously like when you cut up your own writing so if you're writing a piece and you're feeling stuck with it that's actually how I started doing cut ups I was working on this book that finally just came out in November which I still haven't seen but I would love to hopefully see soon (laughs) Um, but um, I was working on this book and I was um, writing about all these artists and then I was like maybe I should do what Burroughs says and try cutting up too because I'm like writing about it and thinking about it and talking about it but I'm not doing it and then basically I've just been doing cut-ups for like five years and then I was eventually like 
maybe I should get back to finishing that book that I was working on that started this whole thing. And as far as like the magic of cut-ups, when, when like Caitlin and I, since the beginning, we're always like, please just try them yourself. Just try them, you'll see. And as far as like how much they've changed my life, I will tell you, when, when I got a new apartment and it was 2014, I think, um, and usually I go through the house and I put salt and I sage it and whatever, and I clean it all out right before I move into this apartment. So this time I was going by to get the keys for this apartment after work and I didn't have all of my little tools. Um, so I said, well, why don't I just like consecrate this house? I like got some white candles from like the bodega downstairs. And uh, I was like, I'll just like light some candles and do some cut-ups in here and see what happens. So, like, I wonder what would happen if I consecrate my apartment with cut-ups and like, my entire life has changed basically so <laughs> that's gorgeous i mean the thing that really sings to me especially as a writer um you know in in fiction too uh those you know those roadblocks and just the ability to kind of maneuver around it by using that tactic is, is such a cool idea um I think, yeah why why is it that we hold you know what we put on paper in a narrative form so sacred you know <laughs> like <laughs> No, I mean, even Burroughs was saying like, you know, just rewrite the narrative. You know, someone asked him uh, a long time ago, obviously, like, what would you do if you were stuck on a desert island? And he said, I'd write my way out. I love that. And I, he was like, I would just, he was like, I'd write my rescue. Yeah. And I was like, okay. So every time I get into a bad headspace, you know, I was like, I've got to write my way out. Like I have to take this time within this day or these couple of days, write my way out, cut it up, see what happens here. And, you know, and one thing that Vanessa and I both did is we both bought typewriters again. Cause I mean, we grew up using typewriters, you know, like, and in order to get back to analog, essentially, you know, I bought cameras, typewriters, yep. you know, I, I really have to dig up these two mini recorders that I have. I know they're in the house somewhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'm surrounded by cassette tapes right now. It's pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> it, you know, and it, for such an integral part of like my, you know, essentially from like 13 to 19, it, you know, it seems important to kind of bring that back. Um, but it was just like this whole thing of, you know, like using these tools, like creating that, creating the narrative using film, using photos, um, you know, and the thing that I like, I think Burroughs probably wanted to express to people. And the thing that Vanessa and I always want to express to people is anyone can do this. Like you just need a cell phone. Like you, you don't have to have fancy equipment, yeah. you know, you can go to the thrift store and get some old magazines. Like you can, there's so many ways to do this. You can print something right off the computer. Like yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, let's talk about maybe some, you know, tactile ways that people just with a cell phone could do a cut up. What are yeah, you, some so, of your experiments? Um, basically, if people want to film with cell phones, I mean, there's plenty of editing apps. You know, some, say someone's like, I can't really afford to get all this like, you know, Adobe, you know, software or anything like that. And that's true. Like that can be really expensive. You know, they can do it right on their phone. I think the phones come with some sort of video editing app, but also there's apps like 8mm. There's apps, I mean, there's even Photoshop apps. There's all these different techniques. There's apps to make glitches. There's apps that make it look like 80s, you know, videotapes. Right. Um, you know, anything that you want to add to that can add a layer of magic. And I call it glitchcraft, you know? So it, yeah. it's this whole thing of just going out there and whether you're filming inside your house, whether you're filming yourself, some people don't want to film themselves. You can film books, you can film the TV, you can film documentaries. Um, there is a film, I think it was Finding Sugar Man, where the guy actually used oh, yeah. eight millimeter on his phone because he ran out of actual film and recorded the stuff that he recorded on the computer to make it look like the eight millimeter. And no one was the wiser. No one knew <laughs> until after. And then they're like, shocking. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. It's the world we're in now. So, you know, yeah. it's very easy to do that. Whether people just want to, you know, film their street, 
walking down the street, like maybe they could even do it in loops, like every day, walk down the street and see what you get and then cut it up. Um, sometimes when you're filming, you won't notice what's going on until you actually look at it. And then you're like, yeah. oh, wow. I didn't realize that sign was blinking, you know, like always open and I'm doing this thing, you know, where I'm like completely closed off and like, here's this sign going, blinking at you. Um, or like when Caitlin found out something that actually said like opening doors we didn't know existed on the sidewalk. I did, yes. Oh, nice. <laughs> it reminds me, I think too, um, just like this sounds a bit loaded, but like the metaphysical power of the pause button on any recording thing. Instead of stopping the recording, you you know you're recording something. Hit pause, and then go about your day, and then you know unleash the pause, and it's already in this kind of linear cut up at the right. end of it. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I love about film and photos is that you're literally capturing a moment in time that can yeah. never be recreated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that to me is like the biggest magic that there is. I'm like, you have just captured something that can't, like no matter how much someone tries to recreate this, it cannot be recreated. Have either of you translated, uh, you know, some cut ups, like maybe, compose something narrative from a cut up like I use did. it to it's, inspire something i mean i i did do a little bit of that when i did um there's a piece on the chaos of the third mind right. site where i took a lot of ancestral writing that i did and i just took out the extras where it said like and the you know and it became a piece it became yeah. a narrative of my ancestry um, so it was very interesting that way because I, and what I was writing about is, is essentially like one of my ancestors that was tried as a witch, like two or three times. And it was like, it was her story coming through these cutups from random pieces of writing that I had done kind of talking about that and magic. That's awesome. Yeah. Vanessa, have you translated some into uh, narrative stuff? Well, I'm. I'm working on a poetry book now. So my first poetry book, Switching Mirrors, is like pure cut-ups where it's cool. like I was cutting out things just like one word at a time or just like tiny, tiny phrases of just like two or three words and putting them in a box and pulling them out at random. And everything is exactly how I pulled it. I didn't do any editing except for I always have to say I changed one word in the book. And it was when it said sofa, I changed it to couch because couch is like an analyst couch. And so nice. that had meaning for me. But other than that, I didn't change anything. The only thing I really decided is like when the poem stopped. I'm like, that's a good place for that to end. Um, so that one was like that. But since then, I, I don't feel like I have to be so purist with my mm -hmm. cut-ups now. <laughs> and Burroughs certainly wasn't. Um, so I'm actually working on like a cut-up kind of novel, like Burroughsian novel, where I, when in 2008, when the economy collapsed, it's like I had just finished graduate school and done my postdoc and got my PhD and got this job. And then we all got laid off because of the economic clash. And I was like, oh, what did I do? I just moved from Miami to California for this, my first job out of grad school. And I was like, what do I do here now in this little town in California? And they're like, well, you can get unemployment. And I was like, what? So anyway, <laughs> so um, I was pretty <laughs> upset and I decided to start writing. And I started writing like all these different memories from high school and my early twenties and that sort of thing. So I have like this whole collection of writings I haven't done anything with. So I've been like printing those out and cutting them up and mixing them with other cut up fodder and then kind of like rewriting the narrative based on like those stories, which has been really fun. And then I've also been taking, I tend to when I write in my journal, I, I re remember my dreams pretty regularly, like almost every day. So when I wake up and write down my dreams, I, I tend to do a cut up afterwards. So I've been translating those cut ups into poems, but now I'm kind of playing with them more where I'm like, oh, well, this would sound better if it went here and kind of rewriting the poems a little bit, whereas I didn't before. I love that. You know, it's something that shot out for me when you were uh, just explaining that was maybe transposing it in a more of a meta way about your magical practice, right? 
So like I call mine divergent magic or, you know, when I was talking to Mitch Horowitz, he calls it anarchic magic. And it's basically cut up magic, right? It's taking and rearranging from different traditions. Uh, would you guys consider your, you know, practices in the same way? Yeah. Yep. Chaos of the third mind. Chaos right. of the third mind. Yeah. <laughs> cut up magic, witchcraft. Yeah. <laughs> Just cut up witchcraft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, do you guys uh, find a, a warring at all with a traditional sense of occultism and and that anarchic magic, that cut up magic? Um, I mean, so with my upbringing, I mean, I didn't really get into any sort of like ritual magic or anything like that. I right. mean, I grew up very much with folk you know, folk magic in the home. And it also wasn't, you know, really talked about. So it was me watching everything and being like, that's weird. I'm going to do it. Like, <laughs> um, Sounds but, familiar. Um, you know, so seeing like the occult community, like I still sort of feel like I'm like the outsider looking in because I was never really a part of that. So with cutups, you know, I always just found my people. So I'm not quite sure I can answer that fully, but I don't know. Vanessa, what do you? I mean, I'm in a similar situation where my magic has always been just very natural to me and kind of mm -hmm. idiosyncratic to, to me and what I'm doing. And then, you know, at one point I felt like I need to educate myself on just different traditions. And, you know, I've been initiated into some and I've studied and I respect them and I love them and they're part of my practice as well. But then of course, other things I studied and I was like, okay, I, I see that now, but that's like not for me, for example. Um, and I definitely can't, I can't get into things with like too many systems. Like I totally yeah. respect if people right have like this whole hierarchy of systems and like grades they go into and like you know all these different angels and whatever that's right. amazing but like my, my mind doesn't work like that it's just like yeah, mine, either. My, mine doesn't either I start getting shut down like when I try it yeah. just like feels like memorization I've never been good at memorization <laughs> anyway I just have yeah. to like be in the experience so yes I yeah I absolutely agree I'm definitely of that mind um you know, one of the common threads uh, through doing the podcast and stuff has always come up with that. It's always been this conversation about the disparity between, you know, internal magics and traditionalist magic. And it's a funny that there's a, even, you know, a, a conversation to be had that there's, you know, one institution, you know, greater than the other, because obviously that's not the case in any way. Um, so, but I love, you know, this, the idea of, the meta or maybe the macro of, of cut ups and using it for, you know, personal belief systems and personal, you know, praxis. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Everything is a cut up. That's why Bro said all writing is a cut up. Memory is a cut up. Like Caitlin talked about in that London talk, you know, you yeah. remember something on the street corner. Now that street corner is integrated into that memory from the past. Yeah. And that's what I think about psychoanalysis too. Like when you go into a session or you go into a ritual or you just go into a meditation, something that kind of takes you out of your day-to-day -day flow of life, you know, you're cutting yourself out and then you reintegrate yourself back into your life after having this kind of pause. It's like that pause button that you yep. talked about. Right. You know, it's like taking a pause, going into another headspace and then coming mm -hmm. back into your life. And I think that's totally life altering. Absolutely. And, you know, with memories in itself, you know, your first initial memory of something right after it happens is the most pure. And then as you re-remember it, it's essentially cutting it up. Yeah, and, I was just going to say. Yeah. And in merging it with other memories or feelings. So memory itself is an actual cut up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Synapses and flashes of certain things mm -hmm. and rearranging them. I know Vanessa probably has more insight in just, you know, how that is formed and, uh, you know, how memory, you know, in, I, I almost said infects, I don't want to sound so nefarious, but like, you know, how it permeates through a person's, you know, future motives and, and operations. And is there a way, have you found, is there, you know, kind of a cut up process that people can rearrange um, these memories, maybe these traumas to be, you know, a bit more, you know, serving in a positive manner in the future? I, I, I mean, I think what we we're talking about before was like the neurosis getting you right. feeling really rigid in your patterns that you've been trained. That's essentially what these memory like building blocks are becoming is like things seem similar to other things and, and 
probably from evolution, we start making patterns out of things, but then we're kind of getting stuck in those patterns. So you have to kind of break out of those patterns or like try to understand them in a different way so that you could make new connections so that you're not feeling so stuck in this one way of looking at things. I think that's what psych people are doing in psychoanalysis or these different kind of therapeutic practices that aren't like, you know, oh, make sure you take a walk, like more prescribed types of therapy. Sure. Yeah. I, you know, um, I was just going to ask to the, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask how quarantine was treating you guys, especially considering, you know, mental health. And it sounds like cut ups should be like sanctioned to everyone <laughs> that's struggling in, you know, very stagnant kind of space. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's had its ups and downs quarantine. Um, you know, I was actually going to write a blog on like how to deal with depression during quarantine. <laughs> because, I'd read it. <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> the past few weeks I was like, oh, I'm in my down space. This is, this is not great, you know? Um, and then I have to start thinking about, okay, what can I do to get myself out of this? Like, all right, I'm gonna have to do something that's sort of creative. Maybe I can do like another painting for this wall, you know, and again, that's a cut up in itself, you know, design, designing your space is a cut up, rearranging. Um, and also, you know, just making sure that I have certain things that I do on a daily basis that I can check off. So like I said, I'm not very schedule oriented. Like, you know, I have appointments and things like that that I can keep, but if I have certain things that I know that keep me in check, I try to do those, like say three things every day to kind of, but then if they start feeling like a job and work, then I try to switch them into another few things yeah. that I can kind of, because I'm, my mind is something I constantly need to be stimulated. Yep. So, yep. um, and that's why people are always like, you're always doing something. And I'm like, I don't think you understand. Like I just constantly need to be doing something. Um, which is why cut-ups are so good, which is why it's important to do them because meditation doesn't work for everyone. For some people, it really depresses them and they, you know, they feel awful after, you know, so, but if you're doing a piece of art or something like that, then that could be considered a meditation. Um, so, you know, I think it is important to kind of get ourselves in and out of routines, um, even if it doesn't feel great to go out for a walk, you know, which is what I've been doing every day. And I'm like, I feel nothing on these walks. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like dead tree, cold, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Why am I here? Gray. Yeah. Um, but I'll take out my camera and I'll be like, okay, like there is like this wall of peach. Cool. There is this neon sign. Okay. And I just start to sort of go and take pictures. Or the other day, like what excited me is like I saw, because I mean, barely any of these exist anymore, but it was like a 24 hour adult shop. And I was like, what? Great. I like <laughs> taking pictures of this awesome neon sign. And I'm so glad this exists. And, you know, so it's like these little things that kind of just sort of get you moving, even when you're just feeling completely uninspired, because like I've definitely been struggling with that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have to exercise, like I have to walk. If I don't walk or like do some form of exercise, if I miss like two days, I could see my mood start going down. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing. If you've been depressed or had panic attacks, that you don't want that to happen again. Like if you've gotten into a really bad spiral at some point in time. So it's Mm -hmm. like, you can kind of see the warning signs that it's starting and I just do whatever I have to do to make sure that doesn't happen again, basically. So I've just been making sure I get out of the house and go on walks. And personally, I've had, I've known so many people that have died this year. I mean, I literally think it's like almost 20 people at this point. I'm sorry. And and, uh, yeah, it's just been really crazily intense. And so I've just been making sure to like keep writing in my journal. I've been compulsively making collages like every day, all day. Another great thing about cutups is that um, you can do it while you're like watching shitty TV, you know, sure. so you can just yeah. be like mindlessly watching whatever your Netflix that you'd normally be watching, but you're like making collages and cutups. So it's like, 
a little bit more productive. It makes you feel a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can see what it says afterwards. I don't even pay attention to what it's saying while I make them anymore. I usually don't find out what it says until I record myself reading them. Right. Um, and yeah, that's another thing with the phone. We were talking about the apps and different things you can do. Um, you, you know, they have the phone app where you can record your voice on the phone. And also like when you're walking around and you want to film different places, um, anything that feels like particularly magical to you or like a special moment or like doing field recording. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'll just like record a field recording. Like for example, Caitlin and I and Carl went to Atlantic City and we walked through like a carnival and it had so many great sounds. And then I just layered one of the voice recordings of, from my phone app over the field recording from the carnival and then that's a track you know and then they made made, made a video for that also just from things that i filmed on my phone and you just put them in iphoto and then if you have a right. mac you have garage band and iMovie right. that's all i use i don't exactly. use anything fancier than that and you know unless you're doing films like that you want you know to be in like film festivals or things like that like you don't need like expensive equipment or anything like that. And also I have known people that have done film festivals that have used an iPhone and not told anyone. And yeah, totally. <laughs> so don't think it doesn't happen, it does. But, you know, like as far as, you know, just like mental health and quarantine, I mean, I'm by myself literally 98% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've seen four people this year. Wow, yeah. And I mean, I am used to it because I work on tours. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there, there will be three or four months where no one sees me, hears from me. I'm barely on social media. And also that's another thing, social media, like definitely try to. I was limit. just going to segue <laughs> into that. Yep. Because it can be time consuming. It can be depressing. Yeah. And it can really just sort of, I don't know. I mean, it's not that, it, well, sometimes it makes you just feel very insignificant, but at the same time, like you're just seeing all of this death, all of this yeah. anger, all of the, you know, and it's just, you can't just constantly consume that because I mean, we're living beings, we absorb everything. So it's, you know, we're just constantly absorbing these things. So it's so important to have these creative outlets i mean also psychic exhaust right exactly <laughs> yeah. with your phone go into your notes and at random pick things from your notes because i have like 600 notes in my phone yeah me too and i just sometimes pick random things and i'm like this is a cut up poem <laughs> like nice. it seems to me a part of the process too is pushing it out yes yeah. Um, and with the advent of social media and stuff, have you found it as another, you know, tundra of like, uh, you know, magical aspects of just getting it out for other people to see, creating something? But it seems like it's not one to spend too much time on. It seems like a lot of the the message, too, is to complete it in a way or to finish it and, you know, push it out into the ether. Am yeah. I correct? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's sort of what the internet is anyway, because two days from now, no one's going to remember what you posted, you know, right. like, so it's like that instant sort of download, like you're seeing this, you're getting the message. Now we're moving on. And it's one of those things where, you know, you do magic and this is, you know, sort of any type of magic, like if you fixate on it, then weird things happen because then your brain kicks in. It's like, but what if? Right. Like, I'm going to twist this into a monkey's paw tail. Like, um, <laughs> self sabotage in a way. Yeah. yeah. But with, like, say something like a cut up that's just going out there, someone consumes that, you know, information, they get that download or whatever you want to call it, and then they move on. They're not thinking about it. Yeah. So the magic is allowed to work however it needs to because that person is getting whatever they need from it and then not dwelling on it. Even if it's, yeah, just a swipe. Right? Exactly. Because it, it seems to me a lot of it singing uh, with an audience in a way is a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you found that, Vanessa? Because you, you've been doing some wonderful things with Instagram and stuff. It seems like you both have a healthy relationship with social media in that it's a conduit for creation instead yeah. of 
everything else that people use it for. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, exactly. I do fall into things, especially with, you know, the past week, Politics, yeah. like, I'll just be like, what? what? Yep. <laughs> I had to just leave Facebook, <laughs> just de delete that completely because yeah, but that's, you know, that's when I'm starting to realize my relationship with it too, is that if I can just, you know, create and share and, you know, maybe figure out a filter to, you know, witness other people's creations and stuff. It's, it's a really beautiful conduit for things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I usually just like log into post whatever I'm like, Oh, this is this podcast or this is what I did today. And then I like have a few friends that also create like Caitlin and I usually just like literally go to them and look and see what I've missed of them. And then I find out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. I can't. Carl doesn't have a problem. He's very, but Carl's very good at like compartmentalizing. He doesn't get yeah. sucked into it like yeah. I do. But like, I'll be that person that finds himself like, how long have I been like looking at my phone? It's been like two hours. So I have to like have good boundaries with it. But another thing is because I'm a psychologist, I've never felt like I've been able to really like talk on it because I, right. I don't like, you know, if patients look me up or something, I don't want them to see me complaining about whatever banal stuff. So I've <laughs> never really posted anything like that. It's always been kind of like work or art related. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. kept boundaries around it as well. You know, and like, you know, Burroughs's big thing too was look around and stuff, right? And like pay attention um and it's yeah. funny now that you know most of us or and i'm using the royal us like stuck in our phones outside <laughs> all the time and it right. figures out that's the that's the safest way for a productive relationship with social media it, it's to experience the art of others yes you know? yeah. yeah and also i mean james recently i mean he's never on facebook but he recently posted, like, I think it was like a couple months ago that he is never on Facebook. He doesn't check his, the messages. And he was like, look, like Burroughs probably would have been horrified by social media. He was like, this is like everything that he was not about. Yeah. And, Control. you know, so it's crazy that our world is so, you know, connected to this. I mean, in a way it's good because there's a lot of people with disabilities that this is like their form of right. connection. They can't leave their house anyway. Distant you know, family. and I yeah. know a lot of people that they're like, this is my lifeline. Um, but we do need to have boundaries with it because I mean, I am a person that I can sit there on my phone for three hours and be like, oh my God, I've looked at like 10 posts because it's just feeding me the same information. It's not like anything's changing. Um, yeah. But you know, I think we do need to have very healthy boundaries with it and, you know, kind of like use it for creation for, um, because essentially like these, these pages that we have are extensions of ourselves. They're little altars that we create. So what are we putting on them? Yeah. Yeah. yeah what absolutely. are we putting out into the world? Yeah. And it's, you know, it's sad. It's, you know, getting people to listen to an album or watch a video is, you know, a million times harder than someone to read a Facebook post, you know? <laughs> so it kind of inspired me today. I want to try something that's sort of cut up with posts, you know, people's posts and see what Absolutely. kind of, uh, what illuminates out of some vitriol, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Vanessa and I used to cut up each other's messages that we would send to each other. We would just yeah. send them out. I'm sorry if you hear drilling over there. They're, they're working on the apartment next door. Oh, no, I don't hear it. Um, what, uh, are there some modern kind of cut up artists that have really sang to you guys that are doing some innovative stuff with it? Um, Other than you two? <laughs> There's only, only the best, yeah. clearly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, people that I wrote about in, in, in my book, I wrote about it in much more of a flexible way. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily have to be like Barosian, Geisian kind of word cut ups. But I mean, like I even talked about like Joe Coleman and how he puts all of the different like little images around the people that he's painting in his portrait. And it's like all different scenes from their lives or their past or like people in their lives or events that were going on in their lives and how that's kind of this like memory collage that he uses. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote about Val Denham and how she integrates her dreams into her into her paintings and how she like dreams about having 
uh, like an, creating an album or finding one of her albums in a store and then she actually will make the album that she found in the dream um, oh, cool. so that's really amazing i love that uh, yeah mm-hmm. little annie annie bandes um she also known as annie anxiety she does music of course but she also makes painting and then collages into her paintings as well so there's a lot of different um ways to kind of integrate the cut up and then of course there's people that do it more like with performance art Mm -hmm. um where you can actually like cut up your identity like bowie of course cut up his identity and so did jen and jay and uh stellark stellark's alive um and he actually like puts technology like into his body and has like filmed inside of his like cavities and things like that very cool um yeah. yeah and so like cutting up his own body or cutting up your identity and like reworking yourself in a new way all of those things can be thought of as cut ups yeah and billy also uses cut ups for his songs too um you know sometimes when he's like stuck songwriting he'll use cut ups and just sort of you know create them from there um and i'm trying to think of everyone right now Vanessa mentioned a lot of people. So, yeah. well, I love it too. I also love, oh, sorry. I was going to say, I love when you, because we were talking before about like kind of necromancy and like mm-hmm. how people fit together historically and how when you discover new artists, then you find out how they were connected to other artists that are already on this kind of journey. And that's why we came up with, well, Carl came up with the 23rd Mind because it yeah. seems to be this kind of like current. And Billy's definitely on that current. And like when Caitlin and I gave our cut up talk at Madame Zuzu's and he was at our talk, then he was talking to us about like going to Jujuka and the Master of Musicians. And of course, like Brian Jones went there and Mm -hmm. Ethan and Burroughs went there and Jen went there. And um, it's funny how everybody has all these different kind of intersections and connections with these certain things. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, it's a six degree of the third mind, right? (laughs) Six degrees of separation, (laughs) 23rd degrees. Uh, yeah what's you know it's it's just fascinating to me too uh you guys talking about you know using even before you've met them like people's works that are still living and and your guys's talk you were like you know charlotte rogers is here and i used her you know i used her writing in a cut up and it's like in in the you know very kind of uh obvious form of manifestation but the connection you know is like a path working in itself. And I've definitely found it through the podcast, you know, people will come up and it'll be like, Oh yeah. And then talked with them and everyone seems like the world just gets smaller and smaller. Yes. You know? That's something Caitlin definitely taught me was like how it manifests because before that, before Caitlin, I was thinking of it much more like psychologically and how that works. Um, but from Caitlin's stories, um showing me how they actually manifest through like her cutting her words up with certain other people and then them, those people coming into her life in in vivo and that's what I talked about in that in the talk that you're talking about in London and how like all of these different artists and writers and psychoanalysts and magicians that I like that I wrote about and uh I took their work I took the work that I wrote about them and then I also took their writing and I mixed them all together in this box and then it was like all the people from the box were then actually in the room like actually talking to each other in real right. time <laughs> and now they've all become friends and like different projects have spurned from those relationships and now there's all this more great art and like writing that I get to enjoy. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. I love and, it too, just as cut ups as a, you know, a form of inspiration, Mancy. <laughs> you know? Right. Like, yeah. Well, also, I mean, just in, in general too, like I'm I'm not sure if I've told this story often, but um when I was first moving to New York when I was 18, you know, from 13 to like 18, I was working on cut ups, you know, doing stuff with like Burroughs stuff and finally got I had this weird dream about him. I was like, I'm going to write him this letter, went to the mailbox, opened up a magazine and found out he died. And I was like, really? Like, (laughs) really world? Um, And then moved to New York. And um, the first person that I met was Burroughs' godson. He literally walked up to me and I had this thing that said Bauhaus. And he's like, the band or the architecture? (laughs) And I was like... (laughs) I was like both. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. And we started up this conversation. What are you like? And he was like, "Oh, my mom lives in Burroughs's house." 
he was like, do you want to go? And I was like, yeah, like, obviously. So, you know, like these intersections will happen when you're open to it, when you're like, okay, like I'm doing this. I mean, I didn't even know what I was doing at the time. I was just like, this is fun. Yeah. I'm a young teenager. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> right. York, yeah. But it just opens up these, these doorways and pathways and that can be really exciting. Um, yeah, and you don't have to know how yeah, it works, that. you know, that's right. another great thing. We don't have to understand how it works. You know, people have tried to argue with me about like, how could that be possible? And I, I don't <laughs> care. It just does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so it's inconsequential. Just go with the flow and yeah. see what happens in your life. Is your life more interesting now? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, these, you know, I have a, it's something I struggle with too, is the over intellectualization of you know these otherwise you know grand kind of gestures magical gestures and stuff that happen in my life and i'm finding more and more that it's like it's inconsequential if it's like real or not or if it's conducted you know from my workings or not the fact is that it happened and to read it as such you know yeah and I, I mean i just <laughs> i just understand that i'm just a person in the, in a multiverse and there's no way I'm going to understand mm -hmm. how this thing works. And I fi frankly find it absurd that anybody thinks that any of us can actually understand how this world works. It's like, it's not possible. So just like, you know, make your own observations and try to enjoy yourself while you're here. <laughs> I'm sure that's a common frustration in psychology and psychoanalysis, <laughs> right? Yeah, I hate when people yeah. try to, to really like... Um, pin things down it's not possible and if anything that's what psychoanalysis has shown me and the world is that like the more you try to pin things down the more there's always going to be like loopholes or ways around it or things that subvert it yep. and that's exactly what people do that's what you know this idea of hysteria is like the more you categorize and label someone the more they're going to subvert that categorization and Lacan even went as far as to say that we have a super ego just so we can subvert it like, like i love it the rebel ego. put that conscious there yeah. to tell us what to do just so that we can subvert it you know that's just how people are so yeah you're, you're giving me flashbacks of a recent argument i've had <laughs> online the the empirical nature of consciousness and i was just like why are we why are we arguing about this you know like. <laughs> it's, like, it's not empirical <laughs> it's, it doesn't mean it's not real like yeah it's just uh you know and that's the other advent of social media too and like all of these mediums and you know the between like the metaphysics side the psychology side all of this and it's i've often said that you know on its worst day that it's magic is like a great psychological trick and on its best day it's you're communing with the other you know <laughs> like it, it doesn't have to be one or the other and you uh should be able to change your mind about what it is you know often right yeah Absolutely. are you guys working on anything soon like in the future is there another chaos of the third mind project coming well we decided to go back into our book and sort of add new, the new things that we've been working on to it and looking to see if anything that needs to be reworked or recut up or, you know, so we decided to do that. Um, I definitely- Is this kind of like a final edit in a way? In a way, yeah. So it, yeah. we were just talking about it the other day. It just sort of popped into our heads. Like, we're like, we need to go into that. And, and because there's so much that we've done and it's like shifted so much that it would be nice to have some of that shift in there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for me, particularly, I'm going to be starting to film again in like the next few weeks. I still have some work that I'm sort of finishing up right now, um, but I haven't filmed in a while. And I feel like I definitely need to kind of get back into that um, and, you know, work with that, that medium again. Yeah. And you're still doing tarot readings. Your Patreon, I know, is like... Uh really taken off you know your interconnectivity with things i mean with yeah. people well with vanessa on her patreon i took mine down a while ago so oh, you did okay yeah i was wondering because like yeah you was talking about you still do tarot readings though is that more I still do tarot readings yeah. um most of my time is between tarot readings and uh I'm almost always working on something 
for Billy. So <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> like I gotta... said, the 13th year old goth heart in me is like awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, so in between, I try to take on other projects and, and things like that. But I am still doing uh, tarot. I did the the hoodoo tarot with Tiana Lee Wukular. And I saw that. It's gorgeous. Yeah. The Sybil's Oraculum, which the hoodoo tarot is a cut up in itself um, because there is collage aspects in there. There, it, Because of the time frame that we had, um, I because I was working on the Smashing Pumpkins tour and then I had to go straight into the hoodoo tarot. So I only had three months to finish the the 78 cards. So I was like, what is the do easy method on this? And it was to paint parts of it, to collage parts of it and then merge them. Um, so it's a cut up in itself using historical photos uh, that were you know, um, in the public domain and also painting and, and uh, things like that, so. Yeah, they're lovely. Uh, yeah, really pretty really pretty cards. Vanessa was mentioning you may be doing kind of your own tarot deck. Yeah, I am working on the concept of it right now. So, I mean, there's so many different styles that I do that I'm like, yeah, what do I focus on? But um, I am talking to, you know, like a publisher, which I've actually been in talking to for like four years now, <laughs> um, <laughs> four or five years now but we're trying to like figure out because it was always timing before it was like yeah. we could talk and then I'd be like oh I'm on the, I am, I'm on this fantastic project now and I can't do anything um but so I I think that there's just going to be a conversation you know between us seeing what you know fits their needs what fits not my needs and go on from there yeah and Vanessa you just had a book come out I think last year right the yeah it came out November violence. Yeah. And uh, you're working on another, you said a poetry book. What else is in store? Um, yeah, that book, the Scansion and Psychoanalysis in our book, that's, that's basically exactly about this. It's about different artists that do cut ups and how cool. you, I try, kind of explain psychoanalytic concepts through the way that the artists do their works so that it could maybe be more interesting to people that like art and won't just be read by people that like psychoanalysis um so I'm, i like to get psychoanalytic ideas out to like more people so it's written it. in a way that like people that like the art can understand it's not like a full of a bunch of jargon and stuff like that <laughs> um so that's the latest book that took up the majority of last year um and so i don't feel like narratively writing for a while after that. Um, so now I'm doing, yeah, much more cut up writing. Um, if I do write something like linear, it's like a, just a short scene and then I cut it up. Carl and I, Carl and I have our Patreon and on that we've been writing a book together. Yeah, um, I love it. The Exquisite, Exquisite Corpse, Corpse. Style. Yeah. yeah, where we, we started, we both wrote our first chapter without seeing the other person's first chapter. So he started writing like this, like, noir detective novel about like burnt corpses that the, that they're working on a case on and I started out uh with all of us all of these 23rd mind characters in Jujuka like smoking with the master musicians so we've had to like bring those two things together and make them like fit which has been really fun because it's um been really interesting and I actually named my main character the same pseudonym that I named myself when I wrote those pieces in 2008 that were like scenes from my teenage life. Cool. Um, so now we've decided that those scenes, I've started integrating those scenes into that book too. Like the, that's her like past, the main character's past. So that's been fun too. And also like this whole idea of like rewriting the narrative, like Caitlin talked about, you know, Burroughs would write himself off the island. Carl's really big into that. Um, and, you know, I think we can clearly see like that fiction does write our reality based yeah. on like where we're living right now. <laughs> um, Cause yeah, this is like a JG Ballard novel basically mixed in with a bunch of other people, but like, um, yeah, like yeah. a lot of things people have written in fiction, you know, 50 years ago, we're living in now. So clearly something has to do with something. Um, so yeah, I'm more inter interested in that in writing like fiction and cut ups um, and not having to like B 
be like a smart psychoanalyst. You just like <laughs> want to like do things that are fun. And then, you know, psychoanalysis right now for me is more relegated to, I've been, the Freud Museum has been doing a lot of online lectures and I really love those. So I've been like getting my psychoanalysis through like online Freud Museum talks. Um, and then and then listening to my analysis. But other than that, all of my free time is spent walking or <laughs> writing uh, journals or doing cut ups. Yeah, I love it. Uh, you know, I was it got me thinking, too, that my generation, our generations are a bit of a cut up, you know, when it comes to past media in kind of this generation of regurgitation, you know, <laughs> like you were just saying like this people have written this story about 2020, you know, over and over again in different mediums. It's funny. So it's, we're living a cut up. We don't want to right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a lot of weird stuff in the unconscious that people don't want to deal with. And that's yeah. why it keeps popping up. Um, we just have to deal with it. That And that reminds me too of artists that are working now. There's a section in my book that I would have liked to make longer, but I actually discovered their work when I had basically already written the book and I just kind of added it in there. Um, but this whole like section called Remix um, and Remixology, and oh, yeah. they, ha they have these great kind of ethics. I was talking to, today, actually I was talking to Paul Miller, who's DJ Spooky, mm -hmm. and um, this guy, David Gunkel, and uh, Aram Sinreich. And there's these great artists that are doing mashups and they do it with music, but also with like digital in the digital sphere and they have the great ethics as far as like not not having any author not having any ownership having it all be in the kind of public domain and like you know everything's already been rehashed and remixed and cut up and redone so many times that there's, it's impossible to find like original sources anymore yeah. if that even ever existed so like why bother basically and I love that <laughs> that's yeah. exactly where I am because it's uh yeah it's just not possible anymore and it's going to become more impossible as things go on so I love it and if any you know anyone's listening to this you know I think this is the best case I've heard for, you know, everyone should be doing cut-ups and it's, it's miraculous. I think what it does for mental health, what it does for, you know, creative praxis and otherwise I'm definitely uh, have already been incorporating it in the audio sigil that Vanessa and I are, you know, she shared a track with me. I'm not going to cut up her thing. I'm going to leave hers alone, <laughs> but all the, all the tethers, you know, <laughs> I might like, so I've, created all these tethers you know to generate into people's submissions and stuff and i uh, had a breakthrough last month that it was like i'm just gonna mix all of the different things that i had been working on in different you know styles and formats to smush them together so uh, i've already been in this cut up space you know sonically mm -hmm. so this talk couldn't have come at a better time um uh, thank think you guys I want to just want to say one more thing, but like Caitlin yeah. said about it being kind of a portal or a gateway. That's the yeah. thing with the cut-ups as well, is like when you do them, it's saying something to you, like you can read it and get messages from it, but also it goes the other way where you can like put messages out into the ether. So so it is this sort of like gateway portal where it goes both directions. Yeah, mm -hmm. sounds like a communion with the other to me, for sure. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. It was lovely meeting you, Caitlin, and always lovely, Vanessa. Um, I hope you guys, you know, have a wonderful rest of your day and get outside and do some more cut-ups. Or I know I'm going to be experimenting a lot with them moving forward. So thank you for having us. Having us. Yeah. Um, and I'll let you guys know when this comes out. You know, I'm like I'm going to pepper it up, give an intro and titles and all that good stuff. And uh, it should be in a couple weeks. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys. Nice to meet you again. And Vanessa, send my love to Carl. I will. All right. Have a good night, you guys. Bye. Bye. As per usual, the art for today's episode was divined by Eric J. Millar of Outlet Press's Bottomless Bag. You can purchase the brand new Communal Oracle off Amazon. There's a link in the description. Support our artistic collective, We the Hallowed. Support Eric J. Millar's Oracle 
or oracular uh, series of ongoing wonderful uh, oracle and bibliomantic works. And please send them some love. I want to thank Caitlin and uh, Vanessa again. Uh, this conversation was recorded a few weeks ago, and since then, it has been playing in my mind and has been very influential on my own creativity. As I mentioned in the intro, there's been some media setbacks, there's been some mental health setbacks, but, you know, this idea of uh, the cut up as a way to break through the molds of uh, regression, of in, like stagnation, has been uh, truly a wonderful experience to the rough and tumble of this whatever retrograde. So uh, please like, comment, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. You know the deal. Uh, clicks help the algorithm. So clickety clack if you don't mind. And uh, yeah, there's more to come from me. I might be taking a small break to finish this big We The Hollowed Audio Sigil project, but I will always keep you in the loop via Twitter and Instagram. All right. And the immortal words of We The Hallowed, haunt on. <laughs>